Hi, this is Dr. Bernstein with our January 2018 teleseminar. Uh, before we begin, I want to warn you that my responses to your questions are hypothetical responses. Uh, they're not always going to be uh, really applicable to your situation because uh, I have geared them to address the general listener. Uh, I haven't done a physical exam on the writer of the question. I haven't gotten a full history. Don't know what medications the person's taking, uh, etc. So there's no way that I can give an adequate, proper medical answer. So these hypothetical answers uh, are just for general interest and to help uh, enhance everyone's understanding of the physiology and uh, even psychology of diabetes. Um, before we start, we have a brief special subject relates to an article in the New York Times uh, the week of this week, which is the week of uh, January uh, uh, 13th. Um, it was in the Tuesday Science Times. There was a brief article on uh, bootlegging uh, blood sugar test strips because they're overpriced. And um, it reiterated what we, what most of us know already, that the price is excessive. The actual cost to make these test strips is probably under 10 cents each, maybe more, not, more like a nickel each, and they're retailing frequently for around a dollar. And um, there are diabetics, type 1 diabetics out there who need the test strips for survival and either can't afford them or uh, their insurance doesn't pay uh, the full cost, etc. On the other hand, there are other people, including type 2 diabetics, who uh, have been prescribed test strips but don't use them, and they've been selling the test strips to uh, a number of uh, bootleggers, probably hundreds or thousands around the world, and uh, the bootleggers then sell them to the retailers at lower prices or may sell them directly to patients on the Internet. Um, uh, the bootleg stri strips, if there, there's a way of getting your money back if you've been shipped the wrong thing, uh, are legitimate in the sense that if the expiration date has not is not short, uh, that is, if it's not going to expire next week or in a month, uh, or if it hasn't expired already, the strips are usually legitimate strips uh, that have been returned by users who have not used them. Uh, just letting you know, you can read the article in the New York Times, you could probably get uh, the New York Times, Science Times internet page, um, uh, probably on January 12th. Uh, the first question deals with diabetic frozen shoulder. And I want to give you an explanation of this in advance of the question. As far as I can tell, Diabetic frozen shoulder is a result of the glycation of collagen in the connective tissue uh, near the shoulder. Um, and it doesn't just show up near the shoulder. You can have carpal tunnel syndrome, which uh, can be caused from glycation of collagen in the uh, carpal band around the wrist. Um, there is Dupuytren's contracture, which has a simple, similar ideology. Um, and what happens is the fibers in this connective tissue get glued together by the glucose. Glucose sticks to protein in the fibers. Usually the protein is collagen. Why collagen? Because collagen is uh, probably the longest lived protein in the body. Uh, in um, uh, 
a healthy 21 year old uh, I've read that collagen has a lifetime of 15 years so once you've glycated collagen it's around for a long time and the fibers are glued together by the glucose and uh, if you uh, try to move the joint that's encased in glued fibers you might tear some of the fibers uh, the, ordinarily they move relative to one another but if you're trying to move them and they're glued together they might get torn apart causing inflammation and this inflammation is what uh, can cause the pain or restricted range of motion uh, on the um, what's called the frozen shoulder uh, it usually doesn't freeze totally but uh, there's a sequence or progression of um, degrees of loss of mobility. Um, one way to uh, tell if you have a diabetic frozen shoulder is to reach, reach behind your back and try to touch your spine. See how high up the spine your hand can go. And you start with the dominant hand, which is usually the first one to be affected, the dominant shoulder. So you move your hand up, and um, then you go with your non-dominant hand and see if the non-dominant hand goes higher than the dominant. And if it does, you know that the dominant one has limited range of motion. Um, I won't go into the treatment, which uh, appears... Uh, in an article that's on the website for my book, Diabetes Solution, uh, but we'll now go into the question. And you'll see from what I just told you, if collagen breakdown in the connective tissues leads to frozen shoulder, could it also lead to eye floaters? Would taking a collagen supplement help? Well, as I just explained, it's not collagen breakdown. It's the gluing of collagen fibers together by glucose. So this question has no meaning uh, when you look at reality. And, it's, and certainly taking a collagen supplement would have nothing to do, would, would not stop the fibers from being glued together by glucose. And of course, this only occurs when blood sugars are elevated. So you don't see it ordinarily in non-diabetics uh, or in diabetics with normal blood sugars. Next question. Would my AFib make RR interval study difficult to interpret? This is a person who has atrial fibrillation where <coughs> the atrium of the heart which sends the signal that causes the ventricle to contract so it's the source of heart, heartbeats. <coughs> um, uh, this person's atrium is sending random signals, maybe a steady signal where the heart is contracting erratically uh, and dangerously. Um, and uh, he's asking whether the RR study which is looking at the heart rate, how it varies with deep breathing, uh, whether that would be affected by atrial fibrillation. Well, uh, it depends whether the atrial fibrillation is uh, paroxysmal or uh, uh, continuous. Uh, if you only get atrial fibrillation on occasion and you're not in one of those occasions where uh, the heart's beating erratically, then you might be able to do an RR study. But if you have fairly continuous atrial fibrillation several times a minute, um, then uh, you're not going to get accurate results on the RR study. Likewise, if you're taking uh, the class of drugs called beta blockers, which slow the heart rate, um, they will screw up the RR study. You can't rely on it if, if a patient is taking beta blockers 
which are sometimes given to people after they've had a heart attack, sometimes given to lower blood pressure, and for a variety of reasons. Um, if you have an implanted pacemaker, an electronic pacemaker, um, you're not going to be able to get uh, interpretable results from an RR study. If you're taking uh, antiarrhythmic drugs, you won't get uh, interpretable results. Um, if you have frequent PVCs, which are premature ventricular contractions, uh, any doctor can spot them on an electrocardiograph. Um, if they're frequent, let's say um, every 20 seconds or so, you won't be able to interpret the RR study. On the other hand, there are some people, uh, usually uh, over the age of 50, who get PVCs just from the deep breathing and uh, a tip in a typical case where we have um, uh, four breaths in and out per page, uh, there may be one PVC on the page that rules out one full breath in and out. That one you can't count, but the other three you can. So um, we sometimes have to take we usually we, we do two pages for a total of eight breaths. Um, we might have to do um, uh, 16 breaths before we get uh, enough breaths without PVCs. My daughter is 14 and recently diagnosed type 1. Her endo said that her low-carb diet has made her insulin resistant. Do you have any advice for us? Well, if, if any, first of all, what causes insulin resistance? We're going to answer that in another question. Um, and a low-carb diet certainly does not cause insulin resistance. Uh, if anything, uh, it will help facilitate beta cell recovery if you still have some beta cells left because a low carb diet is less of a challenge to your remaining beta cells uh, telling them to make a lot of insulin. Uh, so they, they're making less insulin and the antibodies to the, uh, to the beta cells in the pancreas are specifically to insulin made by the beta cells or to GAD, which uh, is a protein on the surface of the vesicles that contain insulin granules, uh, uh, and these vesicles burst at the surface of the beta cell, releasing insulin to the bloodstream, but these vesicles have GAD, which is attacked by the immune system, and if you're not making the vesicles, or you're making very little insulin, uh, there's little of it to be attacked. Whereas if you're getting a lot of carbohydrate, you have to make a lot of insulin to cover it, you're going to be attacked more often and more, se more severely. So if you're newly diagnosed and are still making insulin, you certainly don't want a high carbohydrate diet. And you're asking um, what, what advice, uh, I would suggest that you uh, get a family care doctor who uh, uh, will patiently listen to, to logical arguments. My husband's latest lab presents stage three kidney disease. He was told in February 2018 that he was a type one diabetic and needed insulin. Prior to that, we thought he was a type 2 and were treating his disease with diet. What can we do to prevent further damage to his kidneys? Is insulin the right treatment for type 2 diabetes? We've read your book. Well, I may have said in the book 
something that I attributed to Yogi Berra, but uh, I really invented it myself. What works, works. If the insulin works uh, to control blood sugars and type 2 diabetes, then you use it. Um, and I, almost all of my type 2 diabetics uh, get insulin because I cannot uh, totally normalize their blood sugars with just diet, exercise, and oral agents. Um, I know I have one patient who is a pilot and uh, would lose his license in many states uh, if he were taking insulin. So um, we're, he has type 2 diabetes and we're using uh, a number of oral agents, including uh, things like salicylate uh, and uh, some other uh, uh, non-prescription drugs, uh, and we're, we've been quite successful. Uh, but otherwise, if he were not a pilot, I'd be using insulin. Now, uh, if you're trying to prever preserve his kidney function, uh, I imagine the physicians have put him on an ACE inhibitor. Uh, I'm not certain. They may have a reason for not using it. Also, there's good reason to lower his serum fibrinogen level, which is frequently elevated in kidney disease and could make the kidney disease work. So your physicians may want to look at that. My son is 17 years old. He was diagnosed five years ago. His A1C is 7.2, which is a blood sugar, average blood sugar of around 188 milligrams per deciliter, which is about two and a half times normal. Uh, he is underweight. How do I calculate how much protein he needs? If I go by his present weight, it probably would not be enough. Should I go by the calculations of Michael and Mary Eads uh, from their book, Protein Power? By the way, her name is Mary Dan. Um, well, I haven't read that book for many years since it first came out, so I don't recall how they calculate it. Uh, but the prescription of protein uh, should depend upon your body weight, your height, and also how much exercise you get. Also, if you're growing, a growing uh, child needs much more protein than an adult, and this 17-year-old may still be growing. Uh, if he's exercising, he wants to build muscle, so he's going to need protein to build muscle. Um, so my guess would be, and it might be totally wrong, would be somewhere between one and a half and two grams of protein per kilogram of uh, body weight. But that's just a guess. Um, what I usually do is make my guess first, then suggest to the patient, this is how many ounces you'd be eating at each meal, and I'd show them samples of uh, protein products uh, of, the, of the ounce size that I discuss, and I'd ask them if they think that's too much or too little, and I go by what the patient thinks he can handle. And then we try it out. And some people, I'll never get it perfect the right time. So the initial estimate usually is wrong because people will say to me, I'm getting too much protein for breakfast. That, that just happened to me yesterday uh, with, a, with a young patient. Um, we had to cut out uh, three ounces of protein from his breakfast. Um, or I'm not getting enough for lunch. I'm getting hungry in the afternoon. So we had to add some to his lunch. Uh, so it's a trial and error. Uh, you don't give a person more than they can handle, and you don't want to starve them. What's your definition of the normal range 
of postprandial glucose. To me, it's the same as preprandial. Now, how on earth did I come out up with that? I took a look at my guess of what our ancestors ate and uh, uh, how much and so on. Well, we, we know from historical evidence, archaeological evidence, that uh, before the advent of agriculture, our ancestors ate almost exclusively uh, living creatures and therefore uh, did not eat much in the way of plants. They may have been able to scavenge a, fruit, a few edible roots or leaves. Um, there were not uh, the sweet fruits that have been deliberately cultivated in modern times. So they had very little carbohydrate. And if they were not diabetic, which is likely, um, their blood sugars given only protein, and usually not necessarily huge amounts, their, prob their blood sugars probably did not go up after a meal. Uh, remember, they're non-diabetic. Non so my ideal target is to not go up after a meal, to keep your blood sugar the same before, during, and after a meal. And uh, if you spoke to any of my patients, when we re review their blood sugars, we're looking uh, before a meal, and we're looking an hour and two hours after the meal, and we're also looking uh, before the next meal. And we're trying to have no change. And with many of them, we, uh, with, with most of them, we have very little change, maybe uh, in extreme cases, uh, uh, five or 10 milligrams per deciliter. Um, uh, so uh, ideally, we're looking for no change after meals. What causes insulin resistance? Well, um, first of all, there's mesenteric fat. That's a fat that surrounds your intestines, not the fat that you could grab on the outside of your belly. Um, elevated blood sugars cause insulin resistance. So um, uh, people who, type 1 diabetics who have to inject insulin, uh, will require much more insulin to get, let's say, a blood sugar of 650 down to 600 than they would to get a 150 down to 100. So even though you're only dropping by 50 milligrams per deciliter, you need much more insulin if your blood sugar is higher. Uh, dehydration uh, will lower your blood volume and lower the delivery of blood, uh, glucose, and insulin to your peripheral tissues. <clears throat> so dehydration acts as if it's equal to insulin resistance, but it's more of a mechanical phenomenon causing insulin resistance. Um, inflammation causes insulin resistance. So whether it's uh, osteomyelitis in a jawbone or in a toe, uh, blood sugars will go sky high um, due to insulin resistance caused by the inflammation, which was caused by infection. Um, Many medications will cause insulin resistance, such as uh, steroids, um, certain supplements. Um, there's also scar tissue at injection sites. Now, can you call that insulin resistance? Um, uh, I've found that most people who have come in here who are using insulin pumps are pumping in a lot of insulin because it's not getting absorbed because they're pumping it into scar tissue. Um, so one can say that scar tissue causes insulin resistance. There are probably 
a number of other causes of insulin resistance uh, that I haven't even thought of. Type 1 diabetes for 52 years. Currently takes Levomir twice daily for basal insulin, according to your book. I have heard you say on your webcast that you take Traceba. Is the timing and dosing the same as Levomir? If so, is there an advantage to switching to Traceba? Uh, you ask if there's an, an advantage to Traceba. Traceba is the longest acting insulin that we have currently. Uh, therefore, I prefer it uh, for all type 1 diabetics and even for the type 2s who need a basal insulin. Uh, for many people, we still must take it uh, twice a day. The type 2s frequently can get away with taking it at, bed at bedtime and on arising in the morning. But type 1s, like me, have to take it at bedtime and about uh, six hours later. So maybe two hours before you get up in the morning, maybe three hours before you get up in the morning, so that you end up with two basal insulins working uh, when you arise in the morning to offset the dawn phenomenon. Uh, sort of complicated, but uh, that's life. Uh, the only advantage to insulin pumps is that you don't have to get up six hours after your bedtime shot to take another shot. You could set the timer on the pump to increase the basal rate. Trouble is that even doing that will not give normal blood sugars over the long term. Um, as far as the dose, uh, the amount of insulin that you give, uh, usually it's the same dose as the Levomir, but I initially uh, give one or two units less for each dose just in case a person will respond differently than the average and uh, I don't want them going too low, I'd rather them go too low, too high than too low temporarily. So for the first night uh, we'll have them uh, take a little less uh, than, the, than the Levermere dose. Uh, that's basically it. What's your opinion about the diagnosis of type 1.5 diabetes. Well, I've heard people talk about 1.5, 1.3, 1.25. Uh, this is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's a nonsense diagnosis. Um, their diabetes is a spectrum. Uh, can be very mild and can uh, where you're making a lot of insulin or very severe where you're making absolutely no insulin. There are people who are called type 1 diabetics, uh, usually uh, children who show high antibodies to insulin or to their pancreas at, at some point in time uh, who are still making a lot of insulin and uh, therefore are not thought to be diabetic by many endocrinologists. So here you have a type 1 who's very mild. You could have type 2s who have had type 2 diabetes for so long that their high blood sugars have burned out their beta cells and they now require as much insulin as a type 1 diabetic. So uh, there are all kinds of variations in there and to try to give absolute numbers to the disease you have, to me, doesn't make sense. Um, I say treat the, treat the blood sugar, not the name. And you do whatever is necessary to treat the blood sugar, to normalize the blood sugar around the clock. What does it mean when a diabetic has blood in the urine? Well, for the most part, it would mean the same thing as it would for a non-diabetic who has blood in the urine. So um, 
It could be a urinary tract infection, a severe urinary tract infection. Um, it could be um, kidney stones. Uh, it could be uh, that uh, the patient's taking anticoagulants. Um, it could be a tumor. Uh, if you look on the internet for blood in the urine, you might get 50 different causes. So um, uh, I cannot think offhand of anything that would be unique to diabetes, uh, although bi diabetics do get more urinary tract infections than non-diabetics. Yes or no on sucralose? In your book you say no, but one of the recipes uses it in the diet book. Well, uh, if the sucralose is powdered, there's a good chance that uh, the uh, bulking agent is something less expensive than the sucralose, uh, such as glucose or table sugar. Uh, might even be lactose, might be fructose. So you have to find out what really is in the package. So you look at the um, uh, label on the package, uh, you may be able to determine what other substances are in there with the sucralose. If it's pure sucralose, it should be okay. Is it important to take a blood sugar reading before two hours is up since I started to eat or at the end of eating. Um, I say it could be either, but do it consistently. So, um, uh, of course, if it takes you uh, an hour to eat, uh, it becomes more of a question mark, but I'd say that you could take it, I usually prescribe at the end of eating, but um, if it's easier for you to do it from the beginning of eating, I would say it's okay. And I usually recommend both one hour and two hours if you're adjusting uh, medication doses. Uh, if you've gotten all your doses down pat and you know what you should be taking each day, uh, you can frequently get away with uh, not doing so, such frequent blood sugars. But you have to should have demonstrated to yourself that um, your blood sugar is uh, unchanged at one hour, two hours, and all the way until the next meal. Can I share my lancet with uh, a friend or not? Well, if you both are exchanging fluids on a continuous basis. The Lancet probably won't do any harm if you uh, uh, are trans. Uh, if if you have one, if you have a disease, you've probably already given it to your friend. But um, if you're not exchange, if you haven't been exchanging fluids, you certainly should not use your give your Lancet to anyone else. Uh, by the Lancet, I mean the little thing with the point on the end. As far as the lancing device goes, uh, I would say that if you um, wipe the end of the device off with some alcohol, uh, you can, uh, or peroxide, and you change the sharp instrument inside the lancing device, you could do that. Can you take Trogero insulin twice a day? I'm taking 10 units at night, but it's not enough to get good numbers. Well, first of all, uh, I'm reluctant to recommend Trogero insulin at all uh, because it is Lantus insulin, uh, highly concentrated, 300 units per cc, uh, triple the concentration of ordinary Lantus. So you'd have to be very obese and very insulin resistant to justify taking such concentrated insulin. Um, the, the big problem for most uh, uh, slimmer people is that it'll be very hard to measure a small amount. 
uh, because it's so concentrated. Now, uh, also, there's the problem that Lantus has uh, uh, 165 times the affinity for um, uh, IGF for I IGF one receptors on cancer cells that uh, other insulins have. So. Um, and uh, insulin acts as a growth factor for cancer cells, so you can be stimulating the growth of cancer cells if you take Lantus. Lantus. And there's a lot of controversy on this subject. So, um, if, uh, if you're taking 10 units at night, and if you're a type 1 diabetic, you probably should be taking it twice a day, and you should read my book, Diabetes Solution, because using one insulin uh, to treat diabetes uh, doesn't always work. You have to uh, look at your blood sugars around the clock, and one, one insulin usually doesn't uh, always do the job. You may need pre-meal insulin also, rapid-acting insulin. Uh, type 1 since 1997. Uh, celiac disease confirmed in 2012. Many years of diarrhea. IgA immunodeficiency and lactose intolerance. Irritable bowel sy syndrome and gastroparesis. Two years on a low-carb, high-protein diet. Lowest achieved A1C is 6.8. Uh, that's an average blood sugar of about a um, hundred and uh, seventy. My endocrinologist says it's impossible for celiac diabetics to have A1C lower than seven because of different absorption of glucose in the small intestine. Is this true? Um, first of all, if you have a low IgA, I seriously question whether you have celiac disease because a low serum IgA can cause severe diarrhea um, and is treatable. It's treatable with uh, gamma globulin. So um, before I would say that you give up on your uh, elevated A1C, I would say that you get um, an immunoglobulin profile and that you see an immunologist and find out whether you should be getting gamma globulin and then if you do does the diarrhea go away but on the other hand there's still the gastroparesis and it's a big job to treat the gastroparesis now I have many people on uh, ga who have gastroparesis many patients and their problem is that they can't get their A1C under 5. So getting under 6.8, if all you have is gastroparesis, is possible if you do all the treatments for gastroparesis. And we have a whole chapter on that in my book. So I advise you to read Diabetes Solution. I think there's a whole chapter, but I'm not sure. We do discuss it at great length. Um, Type 2 diabetic on insulin. Since getting your book, I've been able to lower my A1C from 7.4 to 5.2, and I'm having trouble getting the rest of the way. My doctor is ecstatic, but I want to go all the way to 4.4. My doctor says it's close to impossible without a continuous glucose monitor. What do you think, and have you ever used one? Well, I have one. On me right now, I've had it on uh, for, uh, I guess, at least two years. And I think that uh, if you're getting your A1C under five, it's very wise. Uh, in fact, I recommend it for all type 1 diabetics. Um, and uh, uh, there are tricks to using it, which we've discussed in the past, uh, 
you look at my videos, um, there are probably several about the use of continuous glucose monitors, um, and I highly recommend it. I also recommend right now that the uh, only one that gives alarms and is accurate, uh, that is both gives alarms and is accurate, uh, is the Dexcom, and I prefer the Dexcom 5 right now. Please comment on the new insulin pen by com companion called InPen, 0 0.5 unit dosing. Only main problem I see is we cannot get regular insulin. Note, Levomir is sold in Canada and Europe as penful ca cartridges for the half unit pens. Well, in the USA, um, there's a Umalog cart, uh, pen made by uh, Lilly that uh, gives half unit doses. And uh, I have a number of patients uh, who uh, either because they uh, don't want to wear uh, reading glasses for uh, setting insulin doses or um, just find it more convenient to use a pen, uh, are using the Umalog pen, but with regular cartridges. Now, how do they get that? Uh, you could do it yourself and buy some Umalog, Umalog cartridges, draw out the Umalog with a big syringe and replace it with regular with a big syringe, or uh, uh, you can ask a compounding chemist to do the same thing for you. Um, I have several patients who do that. They find it a lot more convenient than using a, a, a syringe with half unit markings. Uh, so you can do that, but of course you're throwing away insulin and um, it's nowadays pretty expensive to throw away the Umalog insulin. And you have the um, uh, you have the Levomir. You'll be throwing away the Levomir to load it up with regular. But it can be done, and uh, it works. Uh, one problem with regular. I should have included this as a special subject. Human insulin can coagulate in the very fine needles used with most insulin pens. So if you have an insulin pen and are using a 31 gauge needle, it could be that 10 hours later, the insulin that's sitting in the needle has totally coagulated and will not allow you to squirt out any more insulin, so you have to throw the needle away. Um, and if you're not checking your needle uh, before each use, you might be injecting nothing, thinking you're getting a, a shot, but your, uh, your blood sugars are going to go up if you're injecting regular insulin for a meal and it's, nothing's coming out, your blood sugars will go up. So be very careful. Uh, this is uh, a very important problem and must be dealt with continually. Uh, you don't know how long that syringe, uh, that needle is going to last without being coagulated. Um, now, if you're taking a second shot only two hours later, chances are it will not have coagulated. I usually don't recommend that in my book, but if you wait five or six hours, it might have coagulated. You've got to try to squirt a couple of units out, get squirted on your hand, you could squirt it in a glass of water uh, just to see if then any insulin's coming out. Type 1 for just over 35 years. Over the past five or six years, however, I've been experiencing a steady decline in my white blood cell count. My initial measurement was 2.6. No, my latest measurement was 2.6. Uh, additional tests do not indicate cancer. 
so I guess he wants to know why. Um, I would check your free T3 because uh, uh, that's uh, triiodothyronine, which is a thyroid hormone. It's the active thyroid hormone. If thyroid function is low, white cell count can drop. Um, you can also uh, see a hematologist if your free T3 is mid-normal uh, because uh, you may have some uh, immunologic deficiency. Um, you could might also want to check your immunoglobulin levels, IgG, IgA, IgM, and if uh, any of those are very low, uh, uh, you should be treated by an immunologist. Uh, so I don't think it's from the diabetes. I think you have to use el look elsewhere. And uh, uh, if, you're, if your free T3 is normal, you must see an, uh, a hematologist initially. Twenty-seven years old, type one diabetic, since twenty years of age. Two months ago, uh, B blood sugars jumped up. Before I was taking from two to three units maximum in the morning and my blood sugar was perfect all day long. But now I am forced to take up to seven units in the morning, and when I check in the afternoon, it's been between 160 and 220. I am now on low-carb diet. Everything was okay, and suddenly everything changed. It's like I sacrificed for nothing. Well, it sounds to me, and I could be totally wrong, of course, that you are still making insulin uh, about five years after your diagnosis. You required so little insulin compared to the usual type one diabetic adult uh, could only be because you must have been making insulin. And then your beta cells uh, eventually burned out. Uh, that could have been from another immune attack uh, most diabetic type 1s get uh, their major immune attacks around age 11 or 12. You got your major one uh, uh, when you were uh, about 20, but um, you could have, uh, have had subsequent attacks. Um, if your blood sugars were normal from the age of 20 to 25, uh, uh, I would say that... Um, uh, we can't blame beta cell burn, I'm sorry, can't blame high blood sugars on causing beta cell burnout. My guess is that you probably had another immune attack uh, or several. And you now have to be treated like uh, more of a full uh, type 1 diabetic. Intermus intermuscular injections. Insulin is a growth hormone. Are there any studies done about the response or reaction that goes on upon injecting directly into the muscle? Well, I have uh, pretty good deltoid muscles, but that's uh, uh, because I do uh, deltoid exercises. Um, uh, I do exercises for my triceps and my biceps also. I've been giving intramuscular injections, uh, I guess, since 1970, um, maybe even prior. Uh, it's a long time, and it's not made. I usually uh, do it with my right hand into my left shoulder, and my left deltoid isn't any bigger than my right deltoid. So I doubt that uh, 
these intramuscular shots have made the muscle grow. Hypoglycemia unawareness. Do usually the hypo symptoms reduce on low carbohydrate ketogenic diets and is that bad? Um, hypoglycemia unawareness can be caused by two things can be caused by severe autonomic neuropathy which is caused by years of high blood sugars but it can also be caused by um, down regulation of, uh, of sympathetic uh, receptors of the neuroreceptors for adrenaline if you have a lot of hypoglycemic events and you're uh, frequently making adrenaline in an effort to bring your blood sugar back up, this is autonomic function, uh, eventually the uh, receptors for the adrenaline will uh, not respond as well and may have very little response so that you don't get the tremors or uh, other symptoms of hypoglycemia that um, uh, one would usually get. Uh, so a cause of hypoglycemia unawareness could be frequent low blood sugars. That is below normal. So frequent hypoglycemia can cause hypoglycemia unawareness. It has nothing to do with a low carb diet. I don't remember, I don't recommend keto diets because most of them uh, are too low in protein and need to protein malnutrition. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, my daughter recently diagnosed type 1. Now my husband was just told he's pre-diabetic. He exercises five to six days a week, is not overweight, Uh, and eats fairly healthy. Although my daughter can't eat the foods he does, such as yogurts and bread, what more can he do to prevent his diabetes from happening? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I would say that uh, he absolutely cut out the bread and he eliminate the sweetened yogurts um, but the bread looks like a big culprit uh, I think that uh, his exercise should be both anaerobic and cardiac uh, and uh, we describe it in the book but the bread looks like the big culprit neuropathy it seems like it will never go away. I've been on a strict low carb diet per your principles for the last two years and I've had diabetes for over 20 years. My question is do you suppose the pain will go away and improve over time from your knowledge and experience? Well, first of all uh, in my experience I've seen neuropathy reverse uh, with normal blood sugars. So uh, the question is, have you really had normal blood sugars uh, for the past two years? Secondly, I've seen painful neuropathy occur after numbness because the nerves uh, are re-sprouting with normal blood sugars. In fact, this is a warning that I give in my book that if you have numb feet and uh, then normalize your blood sugars as the nerves re-sprout you can uh, experience uh, what people have called lancinating pain extreme pain but it usually uh, only lasts for a few months uh, and uh, I uh, actually had one case of a man who did not have numb feet but had painful feet for years and um, uh, had a very high A1C when I first saw him, I think it was around over 11, 
and um, uh, it took about a year for the pain to go away. It seems harder to navigate my blood sugar levels on my menstrual cycle. Uh, can you elaborate and insist and assist? I think I've mentioned this uh, in my book. Um, there, are, there are two things that we try. Uh, glucophage XR, that's the long-acting metformin, uh, frequently uh, stabilizes blood sugars uh, in people who have premenstrual syndrome. Uh, usually, a uh, typical situation, uh, one week before menses, uh, uh, this month the blood sugars may go up, next month they may go down, it becomes sort of unpredictable, and um, the glucophage XR has frequently stabilized that. If it does not stabilize that, uh, I recommend you visit a, um, um, a reproductive endocrinologist who can prescribe birth control uh, pills that will uh, stop the periods. Uh, you take the pills for uh, 11 months and then allow a breakthrough period on the 12th month, so you'll have unpredictable blood sugars on the 12th month, but the uh, prior 11 months you'll have uh, predictable blood sugars uh, and a reproductive endocrinologist knows how to produ knows how to prescribe uh, an appropriate uh, uh, birth control product for your situation I have read that they are experimenting with using stem cells to treat or cure type 1 diabetes given the cost of banking cord blood, would you recommend it? Um, well, first of all, uh, I uh, don't believe that stem cells are currently curing diabetes. Um, and if they were, uh, th th there are many problems associated with them, uh, including the fact that they could be uh, that once they become beta cells, they could become they could be attacked again. So you have to be able to prevent further attacks. But there's still problems. Nevertheless, uh, cord blood banking is a good idea for many other uh, disorders. Uh, you never know when that cord blood can be of value to someone in the family of the infant who provided the cord blood. Uh, for example. Um, uh, I have common variable immune deficiency and my daughter had, uh, had banked cord blood from her daughter and she offered uh, to um, give that cord blood uh, use that cord blood for me to make uh, uh, cells uh, to replace uh, my immune system but of course to destroy totally destroy my immune system and replace it with a new immune system uh, uh, I was not willing to take a chance on uh, so that would be experimental but you never know down the road when the cord blood could be of value for something so I doubt that it's going to be the answer to curing type 1 diabetes but I would still uh, bank it if you think you can afford the cost how many grams of sugar do stevia drops actually have in them? The bottle says zero grams for five drops, but when I use 14 drops in my coffee in the morning, uh, plus one tablespoon of Cremora, uh, which has five grams of uh, carbohydrate, I'm sorry, five grams per tablespoon, my blood sugar rises 30 points with nothing else to eat or drink. Well, first of all, uh, the, uh, I doubt that it's the stevia. Stevia probably has virtually no carbohydrate. But um, the tablespoon of Cremora uh, has three grams 
uh, which, if you weigh 140 pounds, could raise you about 20. So you go up about 20 just from the cremora, and then uh, uh, coffee can raise your blood sugar. It stimulates the production of glucagon. So you're going up by 30. We can say that the cremora is 20, and uh, the uh, glucagon effect is another 10. That would add up uh, very nicely. Well, that's it for the current teleseminar. We'll have another one uh, for February on Wednesday, the 27th of February, 2019. Uh, thanks for listening and watching, and uh, good luck.